is Intercom Television with Staff Sergeant Michael Israel reporting from the National Guard Bureau in Washington, D.C. Each quarter we bring you stories of note from around the world, from wherever the National Guard or National Guard members make news. Today we'll feature reports on a major nationwide National Guard recruiting campaign and the end of a grand air in Europe. We'll also have reports on an Arctic school in Alaska, a degree in burgerology from Ohio, a joint service exercise in Texas, of course, details on our Get Your Guard Up campaign, and Air Guard host in Savannah, Georgia. Our Posting the Guard bulletin board will also tell of Guard exploits across the nation and world. You'll see it all on the National Guard today, part of the Intercom series of Command and Internal Information, brought to you for better understanding of your National Guard. A nationwide recruiting effort has been announced by National Guard Bureau Chief Major General Laverne Weber. The summer-long campaign challenges every Army and Air Guard unit to increase their strength to above their April 1977 level. Strength is our mission, our number one priority, said General Weber. Even though National Guard enlistments have been considered good, strength projections indicated a special drive was needed. So, the Guard's answer? the Get Your Guard Up campaign. It is described as a massive, coordinated, total involvement recruiting and retention effort, the biggest we've had in years. Recruiting activities are expected to peak in August. Proclamations and special events will herald Salute the Guard Month. July and June are being used to prepare for the August push. September is set aside for follow-up contacts with interested prospects. Representatives are enthusiastic about the expected results. They point out that career opportunities are the best they have been for years. Every guardsman must recruit, said General Weber. Together, I am sure we will win this drive to bring the guard up to strength. Riley used to say, what a revolting development this is. Well, many guard members felt that way about the weather this year. It's downright revolting. A springtime blizzard blew into Kansas, New Mexico, Nebraska, Colorado, Wyoming, and South Dakota stranding and isolating thousands of motorists and farmers. Army National Guard helicopters were pressed into emergency service for rescue and transportation of critically short supplies. Kentucky, West Virginia, and Tennessee experienced some of their worst flooding in years. Hundreds of Army and Air Guard members helped house, feed, and clothe displaced families from low-lying areas. Nearly 2,000 Guard members remained on duty 15 weeks while West Virginia's waters slowly subsided. Williamson, Welch, Crum, and Kermit were damaged by the spring waters. Blazing forest fires in Minnesota and powerful tornadoes in Alabama spread our state emergency missions to other Guard members. 145 Army Guard members were called from Jefferson County in Birmingham when a tornado hit the northern suburb. When the revolting weather hits our cities and towns, we can be sure the Guard is mighty welcome. Involvement in the Get Your Guard Up campaign starts at the top. Recently, Colonel Andrew Wolf chief of the Office of Public Affairs of the National Guard Bureau talked with the directors of the Army and Air National Guard at the Pentagon. All of us are aware, to some extent, of the manpower problems the National Guard faces today. In an all-volunteer environment, a reviving civilian job market, and stiff recruiting competition from the services, the National Guard faces strong challenges to maintain required strength levels. For our part, we are currently mounting intensive advertising campaign to attempt to rapidly increase our strength. The theme of this campaign is Get Your Guard Up. August has been designated as Salute the Guard Month. And as a sub-theme, we will be using to do something for somebody, including yourself. We have with us today Major General Charles Ott, Director of the Army National Guard, and Major General John Geis, Director of the Air National Guard, to discuss what you can do for somebody, including yourself. General Watt, I'd like to ask you the first question. What can the individual guardsmen do to help in this recruiting and retention area? Well, Andy, as we all know, the importance of our reserve force structure to our country is definitely with us today. It's the first line of defense behind our active Army and Air Force and our Navy. In, uh, making this free world that we all want it to be. The Army National Guard has such importance 
in this entire picture that it is essential that we keep our strength at the levels that are required so that our units can be manned and ready to answer whatever responsible calls are placed upon us. In the last few months, because of the environment that we find ourselves in, and for many other reasons, the Army Guard strength has dropped approximately 10% below the level that we uh, must have it. And this equates to about 33,000 people. Uh, among the 3,300 units of the Army Guard throughout our many communities, this means we should gain approximately 10 men per unit, men and women, to bring that strength up to where it has to be in order to allow us to maintain the commitment levels that we have as far as the nation is concerned. This, of course, also affects us in our state role. And to me, each guardsman, each guard woman, uh, the communities and the citizens of our country uh, must do everything they can to see that uh, we can and will gain this strength to place us again in the position where we can answer that call whenever and wherever. We certainly feel it in the Army Guard today. All of our unit commanders are actively pursuing uh, the requirements that they have placed upon them. And I think it's essential that each guardsman and guard women understand that they have a responsibility too. And I'm sure that they will feel this. Uh, this accentuation by the campaign that you're proposing is a very important thing for all of us. And we look for this to answer some of the problem areas that we have in the strength picture, both in retention and recruiting. Sir, let me ask you, uh, how are you personally getting involved in this, uh, in this game? Well, in addition to the various staff actions that normally uh, occur when something of this nature is undertaken, I feel it's essential that uh, I go out to the states, and in our normal role here in the, in the Bureau, we do visit the states, particularly during the summer field training exercise period. I'm going to personally talk to the commanders, uh, to the adjutant generals, as we have been the last few months, uh, re-emphasizing the problem areas that we have with strength and suggesting uh, approaches that they could uh, use if they haven't already determined the best approach for their organization. Well, thank you, General Lott. General now I'd like to get uh, the air side of the house. General Geis, uh, what is your guidance to our air viewers on how they can make this campaign? Well, Andy, you know, traditionally, we've been a community-oriented program. I think that uh, more than ever now, we should spread the word to the community, personal contacts, do not rely solely on the full-time recruiters to spread that word. Some years ago, we had a slogan in the Air Guard and throughout the National Guard, that every guardsman, every guard person, a recruiter. That's more important today than it ever has been. We are slightly, I guess, at this point, 60 people below strength, according to the program for this year. We have some growth yet to achieve the in strength. We have a requirement uh, that we should be at least 95% of our manning documents in order to do the wartime job that we need. So we have additional growth next year. The seeds that we sow in recruiting these last few months of fiscal 77 must produce the harvest that is necessary to make food. It's the key to readiness is really what it is. You have to have matting, documents have to be filled in order to do the training, in order to use the equipment so. Sir, I'd like to ask you the same question I asked General Lott. How are you personally going to become involved in this campaign? Well, we're involved across the staff in speaking engagements and uh, personal contacts with the uh, recruiters, uh, advertising agencies, the news media. We're personally involved also in improving training programs, personnel policies that will demonstrate to the, the person in the National Guard that he has reasonable opportunity for advancement, promotion, to learn a trade, meet the challenges, and some interesting work. Last year we deployed seven fighter squadrons to Europe. We are rotating our reconnaissance units in and out of Alaska. We have a C-130 rotation program beginning in Panama. Tanker task forces have participated in Alaska, England, Italy, Spain, throughout the continental units of the United States. In the non-flying units, we're getting some of the latest state-of-the-art radar, some of the latest radio, radios, the Track 97s in our mobile communication units. 
They are very much in demand for exercises both here and overseas. It will be hands-on training, interesting training, and opportunity to travel. In addition, well, personally, recently in a short stay in the hospital, as a result of some interviews and spreading the word throughout the ward, I believe I have recruited two doctors, three medical techs, one nurse, a personnel specialist, and a pilot. Indeed, every guardsman is a guardsman, and you've been one of our ace recruiters, I can see that. I'd like to thank both you, General Ott, and General Geist for taking time out of your busy schedule to help us to help them out there in the field to get their guard up. Thanks again. The National Guard is proud of its diversity. One of the clearest examples in the Army Guard Arctic Scout Battalion. Recently, instructors from the Air Force Arctic Survival Training School were treated to a lesson with the Alaska Army National Guard at Nome. It was spring in Alaska, but still the daytime temperature at Nome was four degrees below zero, as seven Air Force survival instructors mounted snow machines and sleds at the National Guard Armory. As part of the staff at the Air Force's Arctic Survival Training School, the seven were usually giving the instructions to air crew members. Now, as the students, it was their turn to learn more about Arctic survival from proven experts in the field. They, with members of the Alaska Army National Guard's 1st Scout Battalion, were headed for Cape Nome. They were going for a week-long training exercise, planned to equip them to survive on a barren Arctic beach or on the Arctic ice that reaches some 20 miles into the Bering Sea, even in mid-April. When you get down to the basics, the Arctic is the most rugged area in the world. Survival there is most critical because of the bitter low temperature, biting winds, and unpredictable weather. Many Eskimos owe their lives to emergency shelters built from ice or snow. Thus, the construction of huts and caves was the first lesson. The favorite shelter was the snow hut made of compacted snow cut in blocks and formed into an arch over a shallow hole. As the airmen went about their tasks, the Eskimos, in quiet and almost apologetic voices, offered advice to simplify the job. Don't cut your blocks too big. Taper the edges so you can lift them and be sure to seal the joints to cut out the bitter wind. The terrain will not always accommodate shelters made of ice and snow, as the adventurers learned when they moved out onto the ice. This time, tents were set up as shelter. When camp was ready, the scouts took out some of their native tools. Among them was the tuck, a long-handled ice chipper which is essential to the native's subsistence. A scout demonstrated its use in catching fish or crab. Crabbing was easy, a lot of fun, and the instructors had good luck. Pieces of fish were tied to string and lowered to the ocean bottom, 65 feet below. Hardier souls reached into the water and pulled out their prize. Most used a long tined rake to get the crab out onto the ice. Each man recognized his mistakes through his cold arms or wet feet. Does this type of experience really help? They said yes, particularly in a teaching situation. Although this team had not been born, raised, or trained in the frozen north, each had felt the cold, saw potentially dangerous places in the ocean ice, and listened to words of caution from men who really know. The Arctic Scouts of the Alaska Army National Guard. We all agree that professional military education is important to every Guard member. But a degree in burgerology? That's right, a burgerologist, one who cooks hamburgers. When the commander of a tactical fighter group graduates, it's news. It all began when a new restaurant was being planned for a site close to the Toledo Express Airport, the home of the 180th Tactical Fighter Group, Ohio Air National Guard. The designers wanted an aviation theme, and the guard saw an opportunity to tell their story. It was a marriage made in hamburger heaven. Technical Sergeant Bob Barker went about collecting pictures and slides. The intake of an F-84 fighter provided the focal point, while other walls had pictures of people important to the 180th and aviation history. Dedication ceremonies included lessons for Colonel Keith Kramer, the 180th commander, and other members of the unit. Everyone graduated, and the Air National Guard did a fine job of presenting its story in what has to be a high-traffic location. The program you are watching is part of the National Guard Bureau's Command and Internal Information Program. It's called Intercom. Are you getting the word? This program is produced quarterly and distributed through your state public affairs office. It is produced in 16mm film, 
three quarter inch and half inch videotape format. When your whole unit has seen our program, please return it so others can see Intercom TV. Push Pin Post is a monthly bulletin board news magazine. Each unit is provided monthly updates for their push pin post. The separate header board is to help everyone identify that this is a special news board and to check it monthly for the latest happenings. A new series of monthly commander's briefings are also being distributed through state public affairs channels. There is a copy for each unit. Briefings deal with aspects of guard membership of interest to every member. You should have already received the lion's share telling about the guard share in the total force. Look for your copy of Commander Briefings each month. Are you getting the word? Check Intercom for the latest scoop. National Guard Today, Push Pin Post, and Command Briefings. Must all parties end? They usually do for lack of interest or energy. But what about one that has gone on for 10 years? Operation Creek Party is the code name for one of the Air National Guard's longest chapters now being put to rest. Operation Creek Party is over, replaced with more modern equipment and missions. These KC-97L six-engine tankers first took to the skies of Europe in 1967. No one could have imagined that these strato tankers would refuel jet fighters for 10 years somewhere over Europe, nearly 365 days a year. Bombholder track, familiar words to crew members and support personnel of the Air National Guard, they trigger a lingering response from men in the air refueling groups, visions of a long overwater flight in a cumbersome tanker, the perils of operating thousands of miles away from home base, in most cases a separation of two weeks, the challenge of taking over a full-time responsibility normally assigned to an active Air Force outfit, the excitement of visiting a foreign country, the nearness of a sensitive border, and, at the end of the tour, the firm knowledge that they have contributed to the success of a truly historic mission, Creek Party. It started on May 1st, 1967, when a strata tanker from the 136th Air Refueling Wing, Texas Air National Guard, first took a turnaround bomb holder track refueling a convoy of F-100 fighters. That first mission pumped 14,000 pounds of jet fuel. It lasted three hours and 45 minutes. Creek Party spun on around several tracks in Europe. At one time, Creek Party was handling 70% of the refueling over Europe, with Air National Guard personnel and equipment exclusively. They climbed with their jet-assisted Boeings to meet the TAC fighters and reconnaissance ships assigned to the U.S. Air Force Europe. They climbed 6,500 times, making 47,000 hookups. Cruising over the skies of Europe, they dumped 137 million pounds of jet fuel down the thirsty throats of tactical fighters. Creek Party was unique in all the best ways. Air Guardsmen from nine states performed a mission that had a training benefit, but was no simulation. They were really over Europe at 20,000 feet. A navigational or mechanical problem could create an international incident of uncalculated proportion. They were a long way from home, but they performed like it was their own backyard. They were unique in the best way of all. Over the 10 years and millions of air miles, they recorded no major accident. That wasn't because the aircraft were easy to handle either. They never lost a plane. They rarely failed to make a rendezvous on schedule. Perhaps it's not so unusual that Air National Guard aircraft and crews perform so well. We shouldn't be surprised. They just don't often get 10 years to prove their consistency. Thanks, Creek Party. Thanks, Air and Ground Crews. You all did well. Welcome, Strategic Air Command. You're gonna like our bunch of winners. This spring, Operation Gallant Crew 77 measured the readiness of 32,000 Army and Air Force personnel with the help of the National Guard. They met at Fort Hood, Texas, for what U.S. Readiness Command billed as the largest exercise of its type ever conducted. 700 Army and 675 Air National Guard members did their part to help the friendlies of the 2nd Armored Division defeat the invaders of the 1st Cavalry Division. Guard units at Gallant Crew handled communications, military police, public affairs, maintenance, medical, ambulance, and ground attack missions. Air Force Lieutenant General W.W. W. Marshall, Gallant Crew Exercise Director, termed the six-day exercise a huge success and added that he was extremely pleased with the performance of each participating unit. Bringing stories like Gallant Crew to you is one of the important mission, missions of a public affairs detachment. We'd like to show you their story within a story.
The 115th Public Affairs Detachment from the Oregon Army National Guard arrived at Fort Hood ready for action. They published a newspaper titled As You Were, ran a radio studio, and collected the many stories and photos necessary to tell the important story. Their primary mission was to cover reserve component troops as they participated in the exercise. Three-person news teams were composed of a reporter, broadcast reporter, and a photographer. Telling the story of what the National Guard does is becoming increasingly important. The 115th training at Fort Hood gives one more state an importing, recruiting, and retention asset. The better they tell the National Guard story, both inside and outside of the organization, the easier it will be to find understanding and support across the nation. Get your guard up and get the word out. Most National Guard recruiters agree that the single most important step to success in recruiting is to tell people what you've got and where you are. Rosie Greer and Alex Karras helped us put the parts together for the National Advertising Program in the Get Your Guard Up campaign. They'll help you get the word out. Each Army and Air Guard unit has received the campaign management and promotions guide. It describes the five parts of the publicity effort. Each item depends upon a maximum effort to get it into the right hands. Getting the word out is mostly a matter of getting the feet moving. Get your guard up, get your guard up. We got a lot to do. Get your guard up, get your guard up. Help somebody and help yourself too. When you get your guard up, get your guard up. Check out what's going on. Getting the word out is the toughest job a recruiter has. Help get your guard up. Help get the word out. Carry the literature, tell your friends, post the signs. Together, we'll get your guard up. Get your guard up. Get your guard up. We got a lot to do. Get your guard up. Get your All packages will be identified with this rush sticker. When your Get Your Guard Up materials arrive, be sure these stickers remind everyone to give them priority handling. Each Guard member can answer the challenge during the Get Your Guard Up nationwide recruiting campaign. It will take a personal effort by every Army and Air Guard member. Every Guardsman must be a recruiter. The job is too big for any partial commitment. As always, the Air National Guard were the perfect host for Operation Carnet White. The Guard supported two active Air Force units when they deployed to Travis Air National Guard Base in Savannah, Georgia. One of those taking their annual operational readiness inspection was a squadron of F-4 Phantoms, part of the 347th Tactical Fighter Wing from Moody Air Force Base, Georgia. The ORI is designed to evaluate the wing's capability to meet its combat, maintenance, and administrative commitments. In addition to the Guard support based at Savannah, the 167th Combat Support Squadron came down from Martinsburg, West Virginia to perform their annual field training. They provided additional support for the personnel and equipment involved in the two ORIs. The other unit being inspected was the 436th Military Airlift Wing with their giant C-5 Galaxy aircraft, the biggest transports flying anywhere today. America's first minute men. They met the early challenges our country faced on the ground. But when America started to fly, so did they. Protecting the land below from the skies above. Guardsmen whose courage and exploits will always be a part of America's history of flight. Guardsmen like Charles Lindbergh, who helped forge yesterday's modest beginning into the modern Air National Guard of today. Thousands of citizen airmen, ready at a moment's notice to do whatever job has to be done, be it national defense or a mission of mercy. America's Minutemen, he flies too. And you can join him by becoming one of the new Minutemen in today's Air National Guard. Posting the Guard is our new bulletin board of what's happening around the National Guard. Take a quick look at these stories. As if completing OCS isn't tough enough, Louisiana's Military Academy Officers Candidate class recently completed an RTEP. RTEP is the Army Training Evaluation Program. 
which is just coming into the Army and Army National Guard. Louisiana was the first OCS class to take the infantry RTEP. The exercise was conducted at Fort Polk, Louisiana by members of the 5th Infantry Division. It gave the future lieutenants an insight into RTEP requirements for units they will lead in years to come. A combat assault by helicopter takes a lot of skilled, coordinated people. The Missouri Army National Guard recently practiced the CA Alamo at Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. It was an unqualified success all around. The mythological figure Daedalus crashed when he soared too close to the sun on his wax and feather wings. He should have known what the Air National Guard has learned about aviation safety. They recently received the Major General Benjamin D. Falloy Memorial Award for Outstanding Flying Safety in 1976 from the Order of the Dahlians. The trophy is awarded annually to the Air Force Major Command having the most effective aircraft accident prevention program for the preceding calendar year. The Air Guard experienced a major accident rate of only 3.25, lowest in the command's 30-year history. The award was a first for any reserve component organization. Helicopter crews from New Mexico's Army National Guard Aviation Support Facility in Santa Fe rescued two Civil Air Patrol personnel last March. Their CAP aircraft crashed 8,600 feet in the Sangre de Cristo Mountains of northern New Mexico. Another CAP plane directed the choppers to the crash site. Two and a half hours after the New Mexico Army National Guard flight crews were alerted, the crash victims were in an ambulance on their way to a nearby hospital for emergency care. It certainly looked real, a crashed Boeing 727 at the end of a runway at Washington National Airport. Operation CARE 77 was underway. The Community Accident Response Exercise, CARE for short, was a test of metropolitan emergency organizations and equipment. Seven hospitals, various police units, and the District of Columbia Army National Guard participated. DC Guard volunteers and four helicopters were used to simulate an evacuation of seriously wounded victims. When you visit the 144th Fighter Interceptor Wing at Fresno, California, watch out for the peach fogs. Air National Guard security police have a way of being noticed anyway, but when a badge is worn by two dedicated ladies, the fuzz never looked better. Both Airman Heather Edsel and Jackie Howdeshell are planning civilian careers in law enforcement. They're attending classes at Fresno City College. Each of them felt the Air National Guard gave them an especially good opportunity to pursue their chosen civilian vocations with the help of National Guard training. Once a month, each month, in 50 states, Puerto Rico, the Virgin Islands, and the District of Columbia, the roll call is answered. By the rich and the not so rich. Blue collar, white collar, sports collar. The professor and the pupil. But because it's the guard meeting on equal ground, where well, people are judged not by who they are, but by what they are and what they do. And that is the way it should be. Where the only race that counts is the human race. And where the only color that makes a difference are the battalion colors, and that too is the way it should be. Get your guard up by telling a friend what the guard has to offer. The guard needs your recruiting help. Do something for somebody, including yourself. Get your guard up. Bring in a friend. This is Staff Sergeant Michael Gisrael from the National Guard Bureau in Washington, D.C. Have a good day.